Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. The older I get, the more I realize the deep truth of faith. We try to make the world a better place. We try and look at all aspects of life and realize that everything doesn't depend on us. Everything depends on the spirit. God is the one that gives the increase. You were only vital when you were called upon and needed. My name is Warren Kinney. I come from Queensland, which is where we are at the moment, here on the Gold Coast. I belong to the Missionary Society of St. Columban. For about 40 of the last 50 years, I've lived overseas. I'm now doing some work in the parish here. I keep telling people that now that I've been ordained for 50 years, it's time that I practice at being retired. But I'm still quite busy. God is wonderful. Creation is beautiful. I was born in Bundaberg, which is a sugar town in the southeast of Queensland. I was born immediately after the Second World War. Uh, it seems to me to have been a fairly unexceptional childhood. In those days, we never locked our houses or closed our windows unless it rained. And we ran around barefooted. It was subtropic, so we seldom had a cardigan on. Used to go down to the river to fish and uh, out into the bush running around, building cubby houses and whatnot. My parents were both Catholics and from Catholic families. So they were very involved with the church. My father was never happier than when he was in the church, saying his prayers. You could always meet him there if I took him downtown and he had jobs to do and I had other things to do. He said, just meet me in the church, take your time. My vocation probably came in about my 14th year. I remember it quite vividly because I had chicken pox. I was covered all over with them. And I was at home in bed for some days. And probably wondering what to do with myself, I started reading mission magazines from the far, the far East, which was the Columban Missionary Magazine. And I can remember at that time having a very strong sense that this is what I needed to do. But I wasn't particularly happy or thrilled at the idea. It was just, it was like as though there was something in my back pushing me forward. So I never shared it with anyone. If people would ask me what I was going to do when I left school, I always said I was going to be a teacher because I had a teacher's scholarship from about the last two years of high school. Then towards the end of school, for a variety of reasons, I was invited to give the Australia Day speech at the civic reception for the town, for the mayor and the dignitaries, political figures, etc., which I did. And at the end of it, when the press came up to me and said, well, what are you doing this year? Because it was already early 1964. I thought, well, the game's up. I can't keep saying, you know, I've got a teacher scholarship because school had finished. So I told them that I was going to the seminary. I went to the seminary in a sense, hoping that I'd find a reason to leave. I didn't find the reason to leave, but I found plenty of reasons to stay and grew into the vocation as the years went by. I'm sure my idea of vocation has changed a lot since those days. I don't know what it was at the beginning, but I'm sure it was crocodile rivers and 
you know, doing difficult things, climbing mountains or whatever, visiting sick people. But now I realise that, uh, you know, it's crossing barriers of language and culture and ideology in interreligious dialogue. The missionary is the spare wheel on the back of the car. And I think that sums up my life fairly well. I was ordained in my hometown of Bundaberg in 1970, 50 years ago. And uh, it was on the 6th of July. I can remember processing in with many of the priests and the altar servers to the sound of trumpets. And I can remember the hair standing on the back of my head on that occasion. After ordination in the following year, in May of 1971, I was assigned uh, to the Philippines. Uh, we arrived by boat into, the, into a port city of Ozamas, uh, which was the Columban centre house for the island of Mindanao, which is a big island. There were about 10 million people there at that time. After language study, I was appointed yet further south, because Mindanao is in the southern part of the Philippines, and then south to Pagadian City. From there, I was then assigned to yet another place, to Dumalinao, which was just some kilometres west of Pagadian City. Immediately got into work with visiting uh, villages for barrio fiestas and doing baptisms and marriages. But in a short time after my arrival, Martial law was declared by President Marcos and uh, things totally changed. The town was shot up by some sort of a rebel group that came in and fired bullets all around the place, took a few people captive, put bullet holes through the presbytery and people just left the town, they evacuated. The school emptied out, the principal resigned. We had a, a generator that we didn't even put on at night because we were worried and we sort of uh, stayed dressed in case we had to evacuate. So after a time, we wondered what we were going to do because the situation had totally changed. So with a few catechists and some lay people, I started to walk around the villages. It was quite an extensive area. I've forgotten the number of villages, probably 70 or 80 of them through the parish. And we went around and we'd go into a village and summon the Catholics, well, most people in fact are Catholic in that part of the world, and would say, you know the situation, uh, the priests can only get here once in a while for mass and sacraments, so you need to be able to uh, foster and nourish your own faith. And so we help them to try and go through a process of finding good leaders, men or women within the community, and to sort of look after themselves. So things moved, there was creative dramatics, we had social action programs, family life programs, all the different things that you would expect within a parish, but done in a totally different way. There always seems to be crises that pop up in the Philippines, for example, and was it 1972? Martial law was declared, everything was going nicely with people packing the church and villages to visit and then all of a sudden something unexpected happens, a crisis. But I always find if one just realises that God is present there in that moment, that there is always a way through the crisis. Also at about that time, the, uh, the Bible was printed in Cebuano, or the, just the New Testament. And uh, I was amazed at the interest that the farmers and the fishermen in the area had. They would spend hours at night under an oil lamp, reading this New Testament in their own language and sort of understanding it in a way that I had never really understood the scriptures because it was something that verberated with their own experience of life in the fields and on the sea. And also with some of the persecution that they were suffering under martial law. So my time was there, it was very happy. I would have been happy to have stayed there forever, but the word came from my superiors, they need you to study 
dogmatic theology in Rome at the Gregorian University. It was 1974 when I came back from Rome. Late in 74, a tsunami had destroyed a lot of the coastal villages and had also destroyed the livelihood of many of the fa uh, farmers and fishermen. With money that we'd received from overseas for relief work, uh, buying new nets and uh, for the fishermen, and uh, we set up a rice and corn mill so that they could grind the grain, and uh, a community store, because there was no shop, no doctors, no anything within this place, no roads, no electricity. The government hadn't even come back, really a rather strange and unusual experience, even for the Philippines. So I was assigned to a new place. It was Dimitarling, which was even further south. It had been shot up and burnt down, and people had evacuated from this town. But in the very recent times, a confrere of mine, another Australian Columban, had brought Muslims back from Karamatan on a barge that he had acquired. So they were there in Dimitarling. The army had moved in and there were Christians had moved into another part of the village. We had our presbytery, which was nothing like it used to be because that had totally been burnt down. There was just the cement slab and we built a Dnieper and bamboo. There was no toilet, no running water. And that was the way we lived for the next four years. I did a PhD in a university in the UK, and I focused on my experiences in the Philippines through the 70s. After I had completed my PhD, then all of a sudden, I was asked by the Superior General of our society would I be the central lay missionary coordinator? So once again, I can remember it was April Fool's Day in 1989 that he put the hard word on me to take another direction. So I headed off to Ireland. That was to be my central location, my office. And uh, I was there then for another seven years, trying to promote a program that we had just started. And the idea was to send teams of men, women, married, single, to the various countries where we work. So there would be an exchange. People would go out and then uh, people would also be received into the place that had sent missionaries out. So every year I'd find myself traveling through Latin America, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Belize, Jamaica, up through the United States, then in Asia, through Korea, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines. Pakistan, I was there a number of times, and the United States, uh, back through Fiji, etc. So wherever the Columbans worked, we would try and send out teams of uh, people as missionaries to work in partnership with us in cross-cultural mission. Then at the end of that period, I was told that China was reopening. And since we had started off as a group of missionaries from Maynooth in Ireland to go to the China mission. It was sort of, had always been a central focus for the society. So I was quite happy to go to China. I was getting a bit long in the tooth for learning Mandarin. I was already 50, but I thought that I would spend a few years at language study. I'd try to do it. I'd always been reasonably good at languages. I worked away with great difficulty, but I did learn some Mandarin. At the end of that time, it was sort of wondering what to do because you couldn't go into China as a priest. If you went in as a priest, you could just be a tourist and you had to sign a form that would say, uh, you know, you wouldn't practice as a priest. Normally when missionaries go to a country, there's a contract with the local diocese and then you sort of work within the diocese, but this was not possible in China. I was, uh, I had uh, an interview to be employed by the Fudan University and uh, I was uh, accepted by them to be one of the two foreign professors on the staff. 
So eventually, after working with undergraduates and then, then later with master's students and with PhD students, I was able to develop some courses that suited something of my missionary interests. One was I taught the history of Western philosophy within my own key, if you like, some of the more Catholic elements of the Western tradition. And I think the main thing that I brought to the students was to try and get them to give their own opinion. They were very good, they were very clever students, some of the best in the country. So a lot of the time I just said, look, life is very short, even though you might change your mind next year, it's good to give what your opinion is at the moment. Uh, I worked there in Fudan for 10 years until I was 65. At the same time, I had a couple of other strings in my bow. I couldn't be a member of the local diocese, but I cooperated with them. There were a lot of expats in Shanghai, tens of thousands of them, in fact. And so they were interested in having English masses for those. There were also Spanish masses later and uh, Filipino masses, etc. Now, it's always hard to judge how one helps others. But in the scripture, it says that Jesus would always ask people, what is it that you would have me do for you? So I try to respond to people in their need, whatever that might be. If they're sick or if they want uh, just to have a chat about something or whatever it might be. In my period of time in Shanghai, I had noticed as I was wandering around the way in which many people were sleeping rough uh, bathing themselves under taps on the street, uh, looking in windows of houses, trying to watch other people's television, etc. And they were migrant workers who had come in from the countryside, from other provinces, and uh, there were 10 million of them in Shanghai. And they were there doing menial jobs on building sites, uh, in factories, also, as time went by, they brought their families with them, but these children couldn't get into the local schools because Shanghai had its own education system. And so what they started to do was to set up what was sort of private schools, very poorly equipped with teachers that often didn't have uh, full qualifications. I uh, started up a, an NGO called Yodao Foundation. I was a co-founder of that foundation with a couple of other uh, friends. So we sort of helped with getting libraries for these schools, of trying to improve the teaching methods and of getting scholarships for the kids too, so that they could buy books. So a lot of the work was really fundraising, taking the kids on outings and uh, visiting the families in their homes. But after a time, I came to see that, look, just being there as who you are, relating to Chinese priests and sisters, relate, relating to students in the university, to the people that I met where I lived or on my walk around uh, the streets, that that was really what it meant to be a missionary, to be crossing boundaries of language, culture, ideology. So I came to terms with that fact and was quite happy there in my time. In many ways, it's difficult to be a missionary in China. In the Philippines, it was much more um, physically challenging, but in a way, it's easier. I remember my early days in the Philippines, which is almost 50 years ago now. There used to be a young girl running around there with another group of children in front of the church and she seemed very malnourished because her hair was thin. And I remember getting vitamins and things for her. In more recent years, through social media, she has gotten in touch with me. She's a grandmother now. She often asks me to pray for her or her husband when he was sick, sometimes too asking for certain material help. I mean, God has given me fairly robust health, but on a couple of occasions I did get sick. I got hepatitis when I was in the Philippines. I can remember lying down after mass in a village one day, and it took a long time to get help because this place was quite isolated. You had to wait for the wind to be right so as you get a boat out. God has 
put people in my path and they've certainly all helped me a lot more than I have helped them. Eventually I did get there and was in hospital for 10 days or so. To be a missionary is the challenge because it's crossing boundaries of language and culture and ideology. I sometimes wonder if I'm more a missionary than a priest or more a priest than a missionary. I guess I'm a part of both. I'm more like a leader of a Christian community now in many ways than I was when I was in China, when I worked with the Yodao Foundation or when I was in the university. But I think that God can make music out of the cacophony of our own lives. We are all a part of a giant orchestra. I could be just a few strands in a bow of the violin. But one tries to integrate one's life. I've worked with university students since I came back. I have written things for the Plenary Council in Australia. My time overseas, whether it was in the Philippines, working with lay missionaries, or in China with the various activities in social work, with Yodao Foundation, or in the university, that it's all part of a piece. It is faith that motivates the life that I have lived. I am happy to finish where I started. It was 64, 1964, that I left Queensland, and it's just four years ago that I have returned. I thank God for my life, as a missionary priest, and I pray that there will be many more adventures ahead of me. In all its different dimensions, it can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Salon World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.